Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Future of XYZ. I have the distinct honor and privilege of welcoming President of Bates College, my alma mater, Clayton Spencer, to the show today. Welcome, President Spencer. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thanks for joining. I'm so excited about our conversation about the future of liberal arts education, something you certainly know a lot about as a longtime supporter of higher education. Um, you obviously started your career as an assistant U.S. attorney, which is a very different path, having graduated from Williams and Oxford University and Harvard and then Yale Law. Um, and you went on to work with the late Edward Kennedy, Senator Edward Kennedy, on, I think, higher education yep. before moving over to Harvard University, where you spent 15 years as the vice president of policy, and in 2012, becoming uh, the eighth president of my alma mater, Bates College. Yes, that's, that that's pretty much summarizes my misspent youth. <laughs> I love that. Well, that is probably a really nice lead-in for misspent youth versus liberal arts education and how, how can we avoid a misspent youth by getting a strong liberal arts education? Um, so I think the first thing for our guests today and listening is, is understanding what is the difference between a liberal arts education and any other form of higher education? Sure, let me take that on. I would say a liberal arts education is a very fundamental kind of education that we associate mo most with what we used to call traditional higher education students ages 18 to 24. Now that's only about 25% of the people in higher ed. But for those students at that opening moment in your life, liberal arts is supposed to be a broad and deep education driven by the interests and curiosity of individual students. So just to get some basics out there, liberal arts doesn't mean either liberal or arts. Um, it means a broad education that covers all subject matters. Like, I'm curious, Lisa, what did you major in? Uh, I was a political science major uh, with a French minor only by virtue of the fact that I needed that many credits to study abroad for a year. So perfect, right. So, so political science, social sciences, we have history, English, but what a lot of people don't get is the liberal arts also includes physics, chemistry, biochemistry, the hard sciences. And some colleges call themselves liberal arts and sciences, but liberal arts really covers the waterfront. And the main difference from other kinds of education is this is education of the whole person to prepare you for life and work. It's not preparing you for a specific job. Like you don't go to a liberal arts college to become a, a dental hygienist or oftentimes even a business person. You learn things that are going to help you in business. Um, but so it's a, I would say, broader and more fundamental kind of education coming usually. I mean, you said liberal arts is supposed to help you keep you from <laughs> misspending your youth. I would say liberal arts is a recognition that people need to do a lot of exploring and trial and error in youth and don't make decisions, limiting decisions too early in life. And that's what, what liberal arts sets, up, sets you up for. Well, I love that. And I also think, you know, one of the things that seems most fundamental to the world and times that we're living in, and perhaps it was never not important, but it is certainly in a changing and vastly rapidly evolving world, critical thinking skills of, as you say, this recognition of needing to explore is so fundamental. So, Given that, what do you find the state of liberal arts education, you know, to be today? And and I guess given the very typically liberal arts colleges being small, you know, what is the nature as it's changed in the last, let's say, 15 months of COVID? Sure. Well, COVID has been a wake up call and uh, for all of us and an acceleration of some underlying trends. And I would say that the net for liberal arts is this kind of very fundamental education has never been more relevant. We were already in a situation before COVID where there was all the talk about the future of work. And you might have 11 different jobs, five different careers before you turn 50. So what does that mean? 
it means you can't expect to walk out of college and walk into uh, GE and come out 40 years later with the gold watch. It means that you need to have a sense of agency over your own life and choices. It's kind of an intel inside. So one of the most important things to understand about the liberal arts, it's not only content knowledge, it also teaches you interpersonal skills, empathetic imagination, creativity, connection, all of the skills that will let you navigate the world on your own terms and in an authentic way. I, 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 all of those words really, really resonate with me and especially the work that I do as a strategy consultant helping you know brands of all different sizes figure out how they're gonna grow and evolve with that long-term lens and that doing better purposeful lens. And so those words of empathy, connection, creativity, um, and evolution. I think the innate to this is this idea of evolution um, and avoiding that misspent youth, you know, not to come back to that, um, but giving yeah. agency. Yeah, and I would also say your life, I mean, you, you've done brand strategy, you're now doing this podcast. What is that but a liberal arts approach to your profession? You're not waiting to be told that you're in charge of uh, the widgets in bin five. You are putting together your own sense of purpose and mission in life. And um, I hope you feel like Bates was an important part of equipping you to do that. F fundamentally, and you know, I, I just to pause, I think one of the, you used the word holistic education. And, and I think it's just really important because, you know, there's been so long that we've been talking about, and, and I said we, but recruiters and HR professionals, you know, there's this specialization. If you're not specialized and narrow, you're never going to be able to be employed and you need expertise and all this. And there seems to be a renaissance towards the generalists now. You know, I read this amazing article that talked about dragonfly eyes, you know, where there's hundreds of lenses and you put it into one picture, you know. And that, to me, this holistic education that Bates gave me, for sure, which allowed me even then to explore and diversify. I mean, I took language every semester and hard science every semester. Not because that was what I was going to do, but because that fascinated me. It completely killed my you know, chances of being a 4.0 student as well, but I, I did okay. But that education was, was critical to allowing me to develop into the human being I am. Yeah. And let me just take issue with one thing you said. I, I support everything you said, except the term generalist. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the beauties of the liberal arts is it lets you dive deep even it actually, we require that you dive deep. You take a rigorous major and at Bates, you write, a, every senior writes a thesis. And so there's being a generalist, being adaptive, being broadly informed and curious. But then the other thing I would say is one of the particular benefits of the liberal arts is it exposes you to areas where you know you won't be an expert, but you see the expertise. And increasingly the problems the world is serving up, whether climate change or take COVID, that took decades of research to put us in the position to develop RNA vaccines in a year. Yeah. It took incredible sophistication about human behavior, about public health strategies, about communication, all of that. So there's the sense of appreciating expertise, being familiar, knowing where to go for it, knowing what you don't know, but also bringing all those disciplines to bear collectively yeah. on the world's problems. Absolutely, it's a, it's a much better definition. A generalist suggests just breadth. And in fact, what we're talking about is breadth and depth collectively right. and, and collaboratively. Yeah. It's good. So, I mean, given the past 15 months, which have been extraordinarily trying for everyone, but perhaps for college students and, and higher education students, and especially in the small campus environment more than any, you know, do you think that schools and students are better prepared or more agile than they were? And, and, and what are the kind of the consequences of these past 15 months on, on the liberal arts education? So I think we have made changes much faster than usually happens in higher education, which can often be compared to a geologic rate of change, where each 
each curricular change um, is kind of like moving a cemetery. It takes a very long time and lots of care. Um, so I think we have learned to be adaptable and we've also learned a lot about how organizations work. Like people were struggling with all different kinds of balancing acts this year, whether balancing their own concerns about their health with kids being out of school. Um, and we had to become much more flexible and adaptable. And I think those will be um, lessons we carry into the year moving forward. Although we will be back to in-person teaching and education because that's the essence of what we do. Absolutely. But you did actually successfully pivot and, and, and bring kids on campus. I think you had 85% film rate this last year, which is pretty remarkable, honestly. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to see you and raise you a little bit there. We actually had over 90% of our students here on campus and we had the highest enrollments ever because we also had um, about 150 students studying remotely each semester. So we actually, it, it's been a, um, it's been a relentless and challenging year as it has been for most people in the country, but um, we've come through it very strong and I'm incredibly proud of the team and the staff up and down the line. Just imagine serving the million meals we serve every year, our entire student body times three times a day, all on a grab and go basis. So not the college experience we hope for and we will be back to um, in-person dining next, next fall and in-person teaching. Congratulations on that incredible feat though. It's, 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 no, it's no small small achievement unto itself. I, I think one of the things that I'm interested in, again, as a strategist, right, is this idea of like, you know, when we talk strategy and branding, we talk about the, the user experience, right, whether it's a consumer or a customer. Yeah. And many of the top 25 of our arts colleges in this country, you know, what this user experience is for, you know, for students and alumni is paramount to the brand success, right, whether yeah. you're or Williams or any of the NESCAC schools or, or, or beyond, right? Right. So, what do you think are the benefits really deeply of, of a liberal arts education for today's world? I, I know, you know, the, I've heard said that, you know, it's kind of the golden age of the liberal arts education. Um, and, and I know we've talked about kind of the well-being and the well-roundedness, but like very specifically, what are the things that we're, kids are coming away with? I think um, kids are coming away having had deep relationships with faculty who were scholars and experts in their field. And they come away very deeply prepared for the next phase of life. Um, they also come away from a campus where I think our students are very engaged with the issues of the world. So this was a year of reckoning um, across the country as it needed to be and needs still to be on race and justice. Our students have been very involved with that and it's central to education um, because uh, we're supposed to be inviting talented students from all over, um, from whatever kinds of life experiences and backgrounds, whatever their race and ethnicity is, whether they're first gen or come from a professional family, we're inviting them in to have a transformative experience that, that will set them on a path to live a life that is meaningful to them and make a, a contribution to something greater than themselves. So that's what we're up to. So if we bring in students and we find out there's something blocking that transformative experience, that's, that's not something we can tolerate. And Justin is an example. Um, so we've had a lot of, lot of study, a lot of activism on the part of our students about issues of racial justice. But I would say our most, um, thoroughgoing progress so far, we learned in the sciences that many students, let's say a first generation student who comes in and wants to be a doctor. And we had such a rigid and kind of outdated curriculum in biology that students didn't feel very welcome in that course often. And if you didn't do well in that first course, it was very hard to get back on track and ever fulfill your dreams. So who wants to run a college that kills the dreams of talented students? So um, we have completely, under the leadership of a brilliant biology professor, 
who cares deeply about these issues and is first gen herself, we have revamped the biology curriculum so that you can take different introductory courses in, loaded research into the first year, which is known to be a practice that helps people persist in science. And we have won a nationally competitive grant to com continue to revise the curriculum and um, make sure that our teaching is inclusive. It's, it's not a deficit model, but it's recognizing the gifts of students and figuring out the way to engage them. And we're already seeing big benefits there. It's, it's quite amazing because one of the reasons I chose Bates and something that is corely fundamental when Bates was founded in 1855 as a, you know, as a private institution was this idea. I mean, it was one of the first colleges, if I'm not mistaken, to accept women and, and one of the first uh, to accept African-Americans. So DEI in many ways is, is you know, core, a core value of the college. And yet, to your point, we are at a new level. It's also pretty white. And, you know, how do you incorporate this and account for it? Do you, when you talk about activism of students, or you talk about changing curriculum, are there other activities that you feel as a, as a liberal arts college president are needed to kind of take us to the next level and, and really live out the values of the, of the college? In terms of inclusivity, yes. I mean, it's, we, we, we are actually have run training programs in equity and inclusion and anti-racism for faculty, staff, we have huge number, the entire senior staff engaged in a three-day intensive training. So that's partly awareness um, and reflection. And um, I basically took um, foundation money that was coming to me in a grant as a, a mid-presidency mid grant that I could use anyway. And we used it to hire a person on campus to do equity training and education. So that's been huge to raise awareness um, of coaches, of dining hall workers, and of the leadership of the college. We've also made huge strides in diversifying our student body and our faculty. So um, that's an ongoing process, but um, all of those efforts are important. It's fantastic, and especially not to be discounted when you're attracting students and employees, um, whether faculty or dining hall workers, to a town such as Lewiston, Maine, or Williams, Massachusetts, right? I mean, these are these are places that are not necessarily the most diverse and inclusive themselves. Inclusive themselves. So the, the the added effort, I am sure, is well. Yeah. yeah. In terms of you know, we're we're going to wrap up in a few minutes, but I know you know. Education is very expensive. I mean, Ron Lieber of the New York Times just recently released a book talking about like, you know, what you pay for college. I mean, parents are, of course, very concerned about like, you know, dropping, whether it's at a public university or whether it's at a private liberal arts college, dropping a hundred thousand or more or their kids going into debt of that much. Right. And then they're like, and then they live in my basement or what happens then? You, I mean, I think, you know, one of your crowning achievements, if I may say so, as, a, as an alumni, is this purposeful work initiative. Can, can we kind of spend a few minutes talking about what that looks like and how that evolves the, the experience of the liberal arts education, especially at Bates? Sure. Well, I came to Bates right at the end of the recession of 2008, 9, 10, um, where the, the trope of kids living in their parents' basement <laughs> after these fancy educations was out there. And so I basically said, this is ridiculous. The liberal arts cannot be prissy and say, we are going to teach you only pure learning and um, good luck finding a job. Or here's a binder over at career services that has uh, stuff you probably aren't interested in. So my feeling is the liberal arts has always been preparing students for life and work and social contribution. Let's embrace that and let's do it with the same kind of enthusiasm and creativity and rigor we do everything else with. We wouldn't go into our physics department and said, well, you know, we teach kind of at the 30% level, but I think for a lot of liberal arts colleges, that's where career services lies. So purposeful work for us is both a philosophy and a program. And the philosophy is that human beings derive fulfillment chiefly from finding a life that brings them purpose and meaning. 
not going after happiness per se. Um, so the theory is that happiness is a benefit of, of a focus on purpose. Um, and this has been proven out by research. Gallup is famous for its well-being studies. Yeah. We teamed with Gallup on a study of purpose and work. It was just tested off the charts. And one really interesting fact, people who find purpose in their work are 10 times more likely than others to have overall well-being. It's the highest single contributor to overall um, overall self-reported well-being. And then it's also a very, um, a very well-designed program where we have internships, we teach courses during our one month intensive short-term by practitioners and students are encouraged to engage in a cycle of exploration, reflection and revision um, as uh, kick the tires, try things out. So uh, one funny story from Purposeful Work, we had a student from LA who's a city kid. <laughs> His whole life, all he wanted to be was a farmer. And uh, so with Purposeful Work, we helped him get an internship on this beautiful farm out in rural Maine, not too far from Lewiston. And then in the fall, the students all come back who've had purposeful work internships and they do presentations for the community on what they've taken away from their internships. His presentation opened with, well, I have identified one career I will not ever, no, never pursue. <laughs> So it's sort of a metaphor. And fortunately, he was young, young in his years here and had other experiences that probably had a little more long-term staying power. I love that. It's a fantastic example. Um, and it's a very practical curriculum to, to uh, be, be a, what do I say, to, to help ameliorate an already great experience of liberal arts education. So one last question to, to wrap up, President Spencer. I think um, something really interesting to me is, again, talking about all the initiatives in the eight or so years that you've been, or I guess that's seven years now that you've been uh, president. Is that seven, nine years? Nine, nine years. Oh yeah. my God, nine years. That was, it feels like yesterday. In the nine years since you've been president of Bates, you've obviously achieved quite a lot. What are the things that you're looking forward to tackling next? Oh, what am I tackling next? Okay, I want, I really want to tackle the lessons from COVID. Um, I, it remains a big, deep and long-term project to make progress on race injustice, anti-racism. That's hugely important, creating a more inclusive community. Um, we, I want to, grow our program in digital and computational studies, which we founded about five years ago. And I'm sure you know this, but whether you're going directly into work out of college, they expect the younger generation to know how to code and to have, know their way around digitally. And if you're going into almost any advanced field, like in graduate study, in the social sciences or hard sciences, you need to be computational. I wanna to continue to build out purposeful work. And there are two things I wanna make sure, I came in there thinking there are two things I wanted to make sure I didn't break. One is the incredibly strong faculty and faculty culture of academic seriousness and engagement with our students. And that is still such a distinctive um, feature of Bates that I, am, I inherited and I think is fantastic and fundamental. And the other thing is what I would call the authentic and down to earth culture of the place. It's, it's not a pretentious place. Um, we may be an elite college, but we're not elitist. So um, all of those things, um, I, I, I'm, I'm proud to be here. It's, a, it's a, an earnest, noble institution to serve. And it's been a lot of fun leading it these last nine years. Well, it's wonderful. Well, Clayton, thank you so much. I love our, our we got our bobcat, you yes. know. Our uh, garnet. So it's 
wonderful to see you. Thank you for joining the Future of XYZ and exploring the future of our liberal arts education with us. Thank you. Um, I've, I've loved it. And you're such a, a fantastic example of what a base education can produce. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I like, I like being poster child. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's um, we, might, we might get you to come talk to our purposeful work team. I would be happy to do that anytime. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. And for everyone listening, make sure to subscribe if you don't already on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts as well and follow the Future of XYZ on Instagram. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks again, President Spencer. Thank you. Bye-bye.